Good morning, and welcome to the Amazing Arthropod Coaches Workshop. My name is Michelle Saren, and I am with the Department of Natural Resources. This workshop presentation is being recorded separately from the actual day of the workshop because of technical difficulties, but I'll make sure I'll address all of the questions that were asked that day in the course of this presentation. Um, for some of you who've been here before, you might realize that I am new to this event, but I'm not entirely new. I have participated in the event before with the previous event supervisor, and I've been involved in Science Olympiad for many years. So I'm very excited about being asked to do this, and hopefully we will have a great event. So I want to first talk about the purpose of Science Olympiad in general and this event in particular. This is meant to give the students a chance and experience at being a science or doing scientific things. So for me, your role as a coach is to motivate the kids, help them get the resources that they need. But otherwise, it's up to the students to do these events, to put together the materials that they need, get prepared and be ready to go. So please, you're the guide on the side, help them out as much as you can, but let them do the work. We're gonna go over the event rules in general for those of you who have not done this event before, for those of you who have done this event many times, nothing much has changed except the species list and a few other tweaks here and there. The event itself is limited to a team of one to two students. It's 30 minutes long, and it will be comprised of 20 stations, either with specimens or pictures or diagrams or images, with one minute at each station. The students will have three to six true to false or multiple choice question um, at the station, and they will be filling out a form called a zip grade, which I'll talk about in just a minute. There will also be a tiebreaker question, which will be in the form of a fill in the blank. So what students will bring to the event besides themselves, pencil with a good eraser. The zip forms are kind of like what we, we may remember as scantrons. So you wanna make sure that um, if they change a response that it is erased clearly. They can also bring with them an eight and a half by 11 two-sided page of notes. And some of the workshops that are being offered around the area, they may go into more depth on that, how it might be best to put it together. But that's kind of their official cheat sheet, their crib notes. And I often find that when the students put that together in a way that makes sense to them and they get the information they need arranged in a way that they need it, oftentimes they don't even have to use it during the event because they've put so much into putting together that eight and a half by 11 sheet. So that's a good point at which it's nice to step back as a coach and say, okay, here's the framework maybe, or what do you think might work best for you and guide them along but have them put that together. That's gonna to be their tool, their guide for the event. The other portion of the event besides the stations and the kind of test that is incorporated in those stations is their arthropod collection. So I'll talk about both the test and the collection separately here in more depth. This is the zip grade form. So they'll be filling in the bubble. One of the tips I've received from the previous event supervisor is that she suggested if the event team is two people, that they divide and conquer. Um, have one person fill in the bubbles. So they might discuss the question among themselves, or one of the students might say, hey, this is the answer. I know what this is. But one student to fill in the bubbles all the way along seems to be very helpful instead of switching the page back and forth between more than one student. So in the uh, event test, there's a, are the different groups of arthropods listed um, to class for most of them, but broken down into different orders for the class and secta. So the students will have to know the key characteristics of each of those classes and orders that are listed and be able to recognize specimens. They will also need to know some basic biology, things like how do I distinguish between a male and a female? Um, what kind of respiratory system do they use? Uh, how do they acquire food? What are some of their senses? What are the characteristics that distinguish this organism as a part of this particular group? So that's the basics. So identifying a specimen, that's the very first step. That's what they're gonna have to be able to do in order to answer the rest of the questions. 
Some of the other questions may have to do with how we use Linnaean classification to give organisms names. And this is a really basic question on what does it mean at the genus level, the species level, who developed this system? Um, how do we figure out how to name things and where they belong? How to use a dichotomous key. If you're not familiar with those, there are many resources out there, books and online, but basically it's a two question system. Does an organism have a characteristic? If the answer is yes, then you would go to a next question that goes on to ask more questions about the organism until it pins it down to the actual species. Um, if the answer is no, you would go to a different set of questions and go along that trail until you pin it down to the exact species. So it's usually a statement about does this organism have the um, characteristic or not, yes or no, and you go on from there through a series of questions. Uh, various methods and tools of collecting arthropods, which you may be using anyway, so hopefully the students will be familiar with those. Uh, arthropod life cycles, this will be very important, especially when it comes to insects and the different types of metamorphoses they go through. Arthropod defenses and respiration, that's part of their anatomy economic impacts and pest control tactics. And this has a lot to do with invasive species as well. So they will have to identify some which are invasive species and some of the control methods that we're using for those particular species. So these are the classes among the arthropods that the students must be familiar with. And then the orders within class Insecta that they will need to be familiar with. There are many more classes and orders. They do not need to know those, they are not responsible for them. But they should know what a basic arachnid looks like and what its basic characteristics are. Um, same with the insect orders. Then there's the species table. So each year we pick two new groups of insecta, sometimes just one, and then specimens from class arachnida and another class that the students have to be able to recognize and be able to talk about at the species level. So not only do they have to know their physical characteristics, but what are some of their behaviors that we might notice? Um, what habitats do they live in? What niche in the ecosystem do they hold? Are they predator? Are they prey? What other things do they do within their ecosystem? And it's conservation status. Are they a species of special concern, threatened, endangered, extirpated, um, hopefully not extinct. <laughs> I don't have any of those on the list. So they will have to know these individuals more intimately than they would individuals in the other groups. And among class insecta, um, both the order Odonata and Orthoptera, these are the only individuals they have to know. There will be no others but what is on this list. The other question comes up. What about the insect collection itself? So this is not something that you will need for the practice events that are coming up just for the regional event on May 14th. You do not need and you should not bring a collection to any of the practice events or workshops that may incur damage to your collection and they are not going to have anything to do with it. They're not gonna tell you how it's gonna be scored, nothing like that. So. Keep working on those at home. Do not bring them to any of the practice events or workshops. You can either have specimens that have been pinned and preserved and presented in some way, uh, which we'll go through momentarily, or the students can take photographs and they must take those photographs themselves. They cannot take them off the internet or out of a book, um, but you cannot have a mix of the two specimens and photographs. It's one or the other. In both cases, the team number and the student's name must be clearly identifiable. I'm going to look at that collection, see what team they are, and then start scoring. They must be specimens that can be found in the Great Lakes region, but they are not limited to the species list in Table 2. They're not even limited to the orders of insects listed in Table 1. Um, if they can find things around the house, outside in their yards, um, in a park, other places, they can use those. We also had a question about 
Um, can they use specimens that were collected over the summer? If those students collected those specimens and they are the team that is doing this event, the answer is yes. Can you use specimens raised in a classroom as long as they can be found in the Great Lakes region? The answer to that is also yes. So if you're raising Madagascar seeing cockroaches in a classroom, then the answer is no. They are not found in the Great Lakes region. But there are other, um, especially insects, that may be in a classroom setting, and then you can use those. You can use an immature specimen of a species which undergoes gradual metamorphosis. So for example, grasshoppers as nymphs look pretty much like the adult. They just don't have fully developed wings and they're not sexually mature. So it's easy to recognize that they are a grasshopper and they could even identify them to species. Those are acceptable in the collections. The other two forms of metamorphosis that insects go through have nymphs, have, excuse me, juveniles that do not resemble the adults. These are not admissible as photographs or as specimens in the collection. They should be able to recognize them if I ask questions about them on the test portion, but they cannot be part of the collection portion of the event. And then um, all the specimens or were collected or photographed within the prior year of the competition. So since the competition is in mid-May, anything from last year, past that date, all the way around to the date this year are admissible. Adults, please let the students do this on their own. Again, you're guiding. So they are gonna do the collecting, they're gonna do the preserving, they're gonna do the pinning, they're going to do the labeling, it's all up to them. This is their event, it's their chance to be a scientist. Yes, it's a competition. Yes, everybody wants to do their best. But let the students do that. Just help them out with moral support and guidance as much as possible. So for collection data, all of the specimens, each and every one, must have the date, month, date, and year that it was collected, the location, state, county, and nearest city, um, some observations about the behavior or habits, that the insect or other arthropod was exhibiting during the collection time and the name of the collector. All the specimens will be identified to class and then any of the insects will be identified to order. I will show you some examples of this, but you'll see the image on the left shows what the tags should look like and how they should be um, presented when you're using mounted specimens. For photographs, it can just appear next to or beneath the photo, as long as it's an adjacent to the photo in a way that makes sense that anyone who's scoring it will be able to notice that they have completed all of the material asked for for the collection. Specifically for a pinned collection, the box should be no bigger than 16 and a half by 19 inches and should have some kind of surface at the bottom that is permeable to the pins and will hold the pins. An easy way to do this is to take a copy paper box, cut the bottom portion of the box in half, so it's only about six to eight inches tall, um, maintain the lid and put styrofoam in the bottom and that'll be the right size, right shape, sturdy enough, and you can use the lid then to cover it up and put it back on top so that it's safe. Science Olympia provides um, access to resources, uh, professional insect pins and professional vials. So if you go on the website, this presentation is there as a PDF. You can click on these links, they're hot links, and it will take you right to the page within the Science Olympia website where you can purchase those um, items. The vials are for soft bodied specimens. So for example, um, there aren't very many since we're not collecting caterpillars or anything like that, but there are some that are harder to pin because they do have kind of soft bodies, um, specifically some of the spiders, very difficult to pin. So you may collect those and put them in a vial with isopropyl alcohol, uh, which is available at your local CVS, Rite Aid, pharmacy, Kroger, wherever. Uh, so that is how you would use those. And there are also videos on the website through Science Olympiad that show you how to use the pins and the vials properly. 
So this is just an example collection that I pulled off of a picture online to show how the insects in this case are grouped by their order. So in this collection, um, everything is from class Insecta. You would have opportunities to have organisms from other classes in your collection as well. They would just be in that group with their specific class. In this case, these are grouped by their orders within the insects. So the order name is given. You don't have to have that Lepidoptera is butterflies and moths, just Lepidoptera will do. And all the butterflies, moths, and skippers would be in that section of the box together with their um, identifying tags and other information mounted below them on the pin. So you can see how things are grouped here. You can also see how vials are kept in the box. Now vials, if you put them in the box as you're making your collection and carry that into the event, they may tend to roll. It is suggested that you keep the vials in a separate container until the day of the event. You walk into the event and just before you're ready to submit your collection, the pins will be there. You put the vial in where the pins are setting and you turn it in. Otherwise, the vials can become loose, um, knock over the pins, roll around in your collection and beat up your lovely arthropods, uh, knock off heads, legs, wings, and all kinds of other things. You don't want that to happen. So again, carry the vials in separately, have the space already lined up with, with the pins as to where they're gonna go and labeled, and then place the vials in just before you turn in your collection at the event that day. Certain tiny specimens, things like mosquitoes, too small to pin, you would use a triangle, I would suggest cardstock for this because it will stay more stiff than regular paper. Um, three by five cards work just fine too. And it's just a small triangle. The insect or other arthropod is glued to the end and a pin stuck through the wide end of the triangle. Again though, this is only for specimens that cannot be pinned otherwise. So very tiny specimens or very fragile, delicate specimens. Specifically for the photographic collection, you can either use a photo album or a poster board that's 24 by 36. Again, the same kind of arrangement, the organisms are within their class and then insects are within their order. They are labeled properly with that information and uh, the additional information as to date, location, behavior, and collector. In this case, though, they must also list the camera that was used to take the pictures, including any lenses. So in the case of phones, which you may also use because they have really good cameras these days, um, you just list the make and model of the phone and then if they use the macro lens. The photo must be in focus so that I can identify what the organism is. I don't need to identify it to species, but it does need to show the features that make it identifiable as that particular class and or insect order. And there must be only one specimen in the photo. So if a wasp and a bee were both at the same flower at the same time, you could still use that image, just crop it so it becomes two separate photos. So this would be a really simple example of a photographic collection. I just kind of put this together um, on a Word document just to give you a sense of how to organize it. Of course, this isn't complete because there aren't very many specimens here, but this is just one way to take a look at it. And you can see how they're grouped, how the information is provided for their tags, and then the note about um, how the photos were taken. A little bit new this year, and this is not something that the students are gonna be scored on or graded on, are guidelines for responsible collecting. As an ecologist myself, I know that going into certain areas, you have to be very aware of the habitat that you're walking into, the surroundings that are there, and really not impact the population or the habitat in any way um, as much as possible. So we wanna help the students be aware of that. They're not just trooping into stuff with their net, blindly flinging their net around and then trooping back out again. Um, they're a little more conscientious of what they're doing as they're collecting. I wanna point out number eight, especially keeping good records of the collection. This will help the students prepare their tags later on. So while they're out there, it's really good to take field notes. 
as a ecologist, that's what we do. Um, I do bird window strike monitoring for Detroit Audubon. I have to take good field notes. So when I bring the specimens back and, and get them out days later, I can take a look at them and say, hey, I know where this bird came from. I know when, where. Um, I have some other information as needed that help me identify the bird and anything else I might have noted in the area that is important to understanding that specimen. That will also help if there are any questions about the specimens. So if I notice a discrepancy in things or I notice that the collection is maybe just a little too perfect and it looks like an adult may have been um, involved in that, I may ask the students, hey, where did you collect this particular specimen? What was it doing? Just to give me the sense that, yeah, they're the ones that collected it. They knew what happened. They know how they did it and what they observed. So taking those field notes will help them remember that. And again, it's just good scientific practice. And that's really what we want the students to get out of this exercise. So the patients um, that comprise the test are about 70% of the score. Each question is assigned a value based on the difficulty of the question. And again, it will be scored on the zip grade form. If there is a discrepancy somewhere and the students erased it and there's a smudge, we'll go back and look at the forms manually as well. But try and get them to erase cleanly if they are changing one of their answers. The collection is about 30%. I will go over the scoring rubric for that. But basically, you're going to be expected to have up to six arthropod classes, different classes. Um, you don't have to have all of them on the list, just up to six different ones. If they're all insects, that's okay. Uh, it'd be nice to have more than that in your collection. You should be able to find more than that. But six classes is the limit. And um, each of the organisms within those classes needs to be identified just to class. Again, for insects, um, you can have up to 10 different orders. They don't have to be all the orders on the list. Um, those are the main ones that we will be testing on, but you can have other orders without, outside of that list in the collection. There's one point per specimen, up to 30 specimens. And all I want to see in the box are 30 specimens. You don't get extra points for buffer specimens. So if one's bad or it doesn't count or is improperly labeled or identified, that's it. It's not correct. If you have an extra two or three specimens that are correct, I'm not going to count those. So 30 specimens, that's it. And in cases where you have something like a male and a female monarch, they look different, but they're both monarch butterflies. So it would only count as one for, that's it, you have a monarch. Male and female are not from different species. And then there are points awarded for adhering to the rules for um, presenting the collection. So here's the scoring rubric for the collection, the first page, and this is available online so you can look at it there as well. Uh, the first page applies to both the photographic and the specimen collections. So we'll note um, three points for each unique arthropod class. So if you only had insecta, you would get three points. If you have two more, then you would get nine points. If you have six, then you would get all of the maximum 18 points. So have as many different classes as you can up to six. The same with the insect orders. Five points for each unique insect order up to 10 unique orders. And you'll see down at the bottom of the list there, there are spaces for other. So if you have any of the insect orders represented that are outside of that list, you may pencil those in or pen those in and then they will count in your number of insect orders. So that's the very basic level. Do you have these classes represented? Yes or no. Do you have any of these orders represented? Yes or no, up to the maximum for each. Again, no buffers. You can't have any extras. So if you have seven different arthropod classes, that buffer one isn't going to count. Some of these groups have a lot of members, so it will be easier to find members of these particular insect orders. And some are easier to collect in winter than others. You may find some arachnids 
in your home over the winter, typically in the basement. Um, you may find some malacostraca outside underneath um, leaves or rocks or branches or logs. So we've had a fairly mild winter. You may still be able to find things outside. They are there. They don't die over the winter for the most part because there has to be a generation to keep going um, for the next generation. And a lot of these organisms will overwinter as adults. Um, you may find some dead ones in between your screen windows and your um, glass windows. That's a good place to look. Um, old places in the attic. That's fine. You can still use those specimens as long as they're identifiable. So they've got most of their legs. They have their head. They have the things that identify them as belonging to that particular class or insect order. Are they stiff and can you put a pin in them right away? The answer is no, but we'll get to that in just a minute. The second half of the scoring rubric for the collections has to do with adhering to the rules for presenting the collection and organizing the collection. So you'll see there are specific things here for the collection as a specimen collection box or the photographic collections, and then how these were um, organized, labeled, and if pins and vials were used properly for the collection um, of specimens, if cameras and lenses were described for the photographic ones, and the photos are cropped to emphasize the organism and not a whole lot of background. These will count as points that are given and any minuses are taken off based on the, that they were not um, covered as the students presented their collections. So you're already given 10 points right off the bat, and then we take them away if those things were not done. Additional point deductions are at my discretion, and uh, we can confer about that after the event. If there are discrepancies, um, I will write in comments in each of those cases. And if you have um, any issues with those, we can take those up during the Science Olympiad event day. So there are 108 total possible points. Here's an example of how I might score this particular one. Only one class is represented, so that's three points. There are nine insect orders here at five points each, so that gives the collection 45 points. And there are 30 unique specimens, from what I can tell just looking at the picture. So that would give a full 30 points for each unique specimen. As far as I can tell, the specimen labels in some cases are missing information, uh, possibly a date, the name of the collector, any behaviors. So all I see on most of them is they've got the date for most um, and the location, but they're missing other information. So I would subtract two points because the labels are not completely filled out the way they should be. For the photographic collection, obviously this is a very small one, so it doesn't encompass as much as it could. And again, scoring based on the rubric. So when it comes to having the students put together their eight and a half by 11 sheet and studying for this event, the earlier you start, the better off you're gonna be. And it helps to start with the classes. That's the bigger groups learning those characteristics, what kind of organisms fall into those groups, how to recognize them, uh, their basic biology. And once the students have got that under their belt, then move on to the insect orders. Again, only the ones listed on the rules sheet. And then work their way to the individual species in part two on in table two there on the rules sheet. So start off with the classes, that's the bigger groups get those down pat, and then move on to the smaller groups. You can have your students, if you have two in the team, divide and conquer. So someone can become an expert in one set of things, and the other student can become an expert in the other set of things, though I do suggest that both students um, can understand and recognize the classes. That's very important. And have a sense of recognizing and understanding the insect orders. Um, the students, again, will fill in their eight and a half by 11 sheet in any way that works for them organizationally, but you can suggest um, formats that might work and work with them to help that become the tool that they need and will work the best with. Have them practice answering timed questions. Some of the workshops that are available and those are posted online on the Michigan Science Olympiad website or the Macomb Science Olympiad website, sorry. 
um, for local workshops that are available that you can attend. And many of them have a um, mock test activity so the students can get the sense for rotating from station to station. They cannot move to another station if they're done early. They cannot linger at a station if they're not finished. It's going to be a one minute time rotation for everybody. So it takes a little while to, for them to get used to because it's kind of nerve wracking to know that you've got that one minute hanging over your head. But once they've gone through it a couple of times, they've used their crib sheet. They make changes to their crib sheet along the way for what works better. They will get the, the hang of it. The more times they do it, the more comfortable they'll become. Also, you know, develop some games. Um, you can use online games like Kahoot. You can make up your own Jeopardy board with three by five cards, whatever works, make it fun. Um, you'll get involved in that end of it. So you can create those things to help the students learn the things they need to for this event. Feel free to go all out, have a good time with it. Um, have the students help you create the games, whatever it takes, but try to make it fun and interesting at the same time. And then in preparation for your collection, if you're doing the specimen collection, especially collect extras of readily available insects. Um, as this example says, like dead flies that you might find between your screen window and your rig of the glass pane window. That way they can get practice with pinning and mounting their specimens. And if they bust up the first few, that's fine. They'll have others to use after that. And again, uh, videos about pinning, relaxing specimens and um, proper mounting are available on the website. One other suggestion, and I think this might be, okay, I'm gonna go back. Um, you can collect things early, as I mentioned before, and you will not necessarily want to start pinning everything right away because if you have them in the box and the box gets knocked over or the cat gets into the box or the younger sibling starts playing around with it, whatever happens to it, you don't want to um, damage those specimens. So the suggestion from the previous event supervisor Put your collected specimens in plastic bags. You may want to add a little air to those bags so they're kind of puffy and things don't sit on them and flatten them. Put those bags in a box in your freezer. Then the specimens will not break down and decompose. They'll be out of the way and no harm will come to them. They'll be ready to go when you're ready. Then when it's time to put together the collection, you can remove them from the freezer, let them thaw out a bit, and then do the relaxing and pinning portions um, and mounting of the specimens in the collection. So collect, collect, collect. Try not to over collect in any one place. If the things are already dead, that's fine. They're still usable as long again as they have the identifiable body parts that they will need. All right, so there's great resources and study tools posted for you on the Macomb Science Olympiad site. There's a study guide, there's an anatomy workbook, um, and workbooks for the insect orders and individual species for the students to use, the relaxing pitting and using files videos, the scoring rubric, and asking questions is the FAQ portion at the bottom of that website. So for Amazing Arthropods, if you have any questions, you may not contact me directly. What you'll have to do is submit your question to the Science Olympiad site, the question will come to me, I will answer the question, and it will be posted back on the site. That way it's available to everyone. So everyone has that resource for them. If that question comes up in their own minds, it's there already, everybody gets a fair shake at seeing everything and it's available to them. In terms of other resources outside of Science Olympiad, I have a few suggestions. My favorite book is the National Wildlife Federation Field Guide to Insects and Spiders. It does cover all of the classes that you will need for this event. It has lovely little basic uh, anatomical drawings for each of the groups. And it has some nice uh, sample pictures of representative members of those groups. Some of them are not found in this area. This is not the kind of key to, you would use to identify down to species but it will definitely get you to class and order. Um, there are also lots of good online resources, especially for using dichotomous keys that walk you through. 
how to identify things. Do they have wings? Do they not have wings? How many legs do they have? Six, eight, more than eight. How many body parts? How many antenna? Um, so there are keys already online available to help work through that. If you want to look at real specimens, um, you can make an appointment with the Michigan State University Bug House to see their collection and talk to an expert there. If you're having some difficulty identifying a specimen, you're welcome to use Bug Guide, which is an online consortium of professionals and amateurs who just love uh, insects and other arthropods sometimes show up there too. So they can help you out with some things and give you some pointers and tips. And then again, there are workshops in the region at some of the local nature centers. So check that out on the website and um, attend those if at all possible. Thank you for joining me today for the Amazing Arthropods Coaches Workshop. Good luck with the event and uh, cheer on your students, be there for them, support them. But again, it's their event. Let them go for it and do their thing. And hopefully they'll learn something and have a good time at the same time. Thank you for joining us today.